I've been wanting to mix things up for a little while, so we are starting a new series called Is It Worth It? where we look at games, particularly older games, and review them in a modern context based on whether or not they're worth both your time and your money. The very first game I'd like to showcase is my favorite game of all time, Star Control 2, now commonly known as the Urquan Masters. I'm going to be reviewing games in five categories. One, the game's historical context and current legacy, because some games are worth checking out for their importance in the gaming world. Two, the game itself in terms of story, presentation, graphics and sound, and whether or not these elements stand up to today's games. Three, the gameplay itself, of course. Four, is the game worth your time, which factors in game length, how easy it is to pick up and play, and other modern conveniences that today's gamers expect. And five, whether or not it's worth your money to purchase the game to play it properly and legally. Even though this is my favorite game of all time, I'm going to be looking at it with a critical lens. So here we go. This is, is Star Control 2 with the Urquan Masters worth playing today? Star Control 2 is a massive space adventure and space combat game created by Toys for Bob, who went on to create the super massive Skylanders series, as well as developing the modernized remakes of the Spyro the Dragon trilogy. With such an impressive legacy in this decade, what was their resume like back in the early 90s? Toys for Bob was founded in 1989 by three people, one of whom had worked at EA back when it was known as Electronic Arts and was actually a respectable name in gaming, and he designed games like Mail Order Monsters and Archon. These games featured a premise that combined chess and space war. Move your pieces to get power-ups and capture your opponent's pieces, but when pieces meet, instead of the attacker always winning, you enter one-on-one -on -one combat where the winner remains. That would have made chess a lot more engaging for me as a kid. The original Star Control, released for PC in 1990 and Commodore 64 in 1991, fit this pattern, depicting a war between two alien teams. But instead of generic spaceship classes that were just recolors depending on the team, these two teams were composed of seven distinct alien races each, with every alien race piloting a uniquely designed ship with unique weapons and abilities. Players, or computer-controlled opponents, would take turns building and moving these various ships to acquire and fortify territory and resources while approaching the enemy for one-on-one -on -one ship combat. Star Control was received well, and Toys for Bob started working on a sequel to expand the Star Control universe with Star Control 2. Released in 1992 for MS-DOS computers, Star Control 2 broke free from the developer's earlier trends in games by forgoing the turn-based strategy elements altogether. While it did keep the one-on-one -on -one ship combat of its predecessor, it replaced the turn-based elements with a science fiction adventure game that more closely resembled contemporary computer RPGs with a variety of choices for player customization, dialogue trees, and a huge lore-filled world to explore. Critics praised the game highly, and Star Control 2 regularly appears on Best Game Ever lists, with IGN naming it the 17th best computer game of all time in 2005, and as recently as 2013, it was the unofficial winner of Kotaku's crowdsourced Best PC Games of All Time list. Star Control 2's reception is best seen though in its fan communities, which are thriving to this day. Not only are people still playing and talking about Star Control 2 and its lore, but fans have come together and created many fan projects over the years, the most impressive of which being a complete HD remaster of the game. But we'll get to that later. Star Control 2 spawned two sequels, namely Star Control 3, which fans don't like to talk about, and controversial series reboot, Star Control Origins. While Star Control isn't the biggest name in gaming, it's arguable that its influence has reached games that are still being released today, including popular games like FTL, or Faster Than Light, and the Mass Effect series. It has a pretty impressive legacy for a game that most modern gamers haven't heard of, so let's look at why it might have been praised so well. In the first Star Control, an evil alien race known as the Urquan crossed the galaxy recruiting aliens to fight for them as slaves. Us Earthlings, who have only been spacefaring for a short time by this point, get recruited into the alliance of free stars who are opposed to becoming slaves. In Star Control 2, it turns out that the alliance of free stars lost the war and players find out almost immediately that Earth has become a de-weaponized slave world to the titular Urquan Masters. It's your job, as the captain of a huge customizable vessel that escaped from a secret colony world, 
to seek out the former members of the Alliance and exact revenge on the Urquan so that Earth can once again be free. This might not sound like a groundbreaking plot, but the beauty of Star Control 2 is in its characters and its constantly changing world. Rather than having shades of black, white, and grey morality, many of the races follow completely alien moral codes. The blobby Unga, for example, have funny and not funny to replace good and evil as the primary guiding factors on their moral compass. Another pair of races have moral codes that reflect different aspects of bureaucracy and business transactions. There is no race that is universally good for the sake of being good, and none that are simply evil just to be evil or just because they want power. Even the Urquan masters who are responsible for enslaving the Earth. Where Star Control 2 truly shines is in its presentation. The game features over 20 alien races to converse with, and through dialogue trees, players are able to deal with diplomacy any way they see fit. Want to shoot first and ask questions later? You can do that. Want to insult your allies' appearances? You can do that. Want to forge alliances in unlikely places through kind words and favors? You can do that too, of course. And all these different directions can lead you to the end of the game. And you'll definitely want to explore many of the dialogue options. Each of these races has their funny moments with memorable and quotable lines coming at players constantly. Despite the often lighthearted tone of the game, it still manages to deliver some heavy punches. You'll find helpless creatures caught up in deadly messes, you can sign contracts with slave traders and war-hungry battle thralls, and you can find alien races driven to extinction. Or worse. And some of the aliens are just plain creepy. Ugh. Above all, the most exciting aspect of the game's story is that players feel like they are discovering it rather than observing it. History and current events are learned by saying the right things to the right aliens, bringing the right artifact to the right people, happening across the right planet, or heading somewhere based on old information and finding out that you arrived a few years too late. Or too early. Star Control 2's characters and presentation make the story exciting, and it truly feels that as a player, you're part of the story, uncovering the secrets of the universe and solving as many of its problems as you can. The element of discovery, along with the game's charm, really lets the story stand up to those told even in modern games today. As for the graphics, the original graphics are very well done but don't really hold up to what even indie games are capable of today. That being said, the completely free fan-made HD remaster brings the game up to at least indie level graphics. While the aliens' faces don't convey the same level of emotion as the characters in, say, Heavy Rain or The Last of Us, obviously, they definitely look cool. The scary aliens are scary, the cute aliens are cute, and the planets look like they could really exist. The original music is great, and when Star Control 2 was ported to the 3DO, some of the tracks got an upgrade. Since that's the version that I played, I have a lot of nostalgia for these tracks, and I think the hyperspace theme in particular is much better on the 3DO. Others prefer the PC version, which sounds more chiptune. There's also the remixed tracks that are available in the modern version of the game if you want very high quality music, but in my opinion, the tracks, while great for listening to outside of the game, they don't really match the same atmosphere and pacing that the original tracks had. Every alien race you encounter has its own unique musical theme, with a variety of genres ranging from rock to techno-y kind of music, and each track fits the races really well. The fan remixed music available in the remake, Urquan Masters, pushes the tracks from video game music into respectable instrumentals in their genres, and the authors behind the remixes really demonstrate how great the original tracks are. But again, the original music is perfectly fine even today as part of a video game. The sound effects in the game are great too, with each weapon coming with its own launch sound effect ranging from satisfying blasts of various sizes, to the fuzzy static of antimatter, to the cute tongue attack sound. While dialogue was originally unvoiced, the 3DO port of the game added full voicing to virtually every single line of dialogue in the original game, so players could finally listen to what an Illrath sounds like. And now, you die. While some people say the voices ruined the aliens for them, I think that's just the same way that hearing characters in a movie based on a book destroys the voices you create in your head for them. In my opinion, the voices are great. In the HD remaster, they re-recorded three of the alien voices, two just so they could add a couple lines of missing dialogue back in, wow, and one because many fans found the original voice kind of annoying. The HD remaster really goes above and beyond to fix everything. Where some modern gamers might have some problems with the game is in its gameplay, but let's start with the basics. 
When you boot up the game, you can select either the main game or Super Melee, which lets you test out virtually all of the ships from both star controls in head-to-head -head combat. As an adventure game at heart, the gameplay falls into four categories – exploration, gathering resources, communication and diplomacy, and ship-to-ship -ship combat. When you start a new game, you're first presented with the exploration aspect of the game. No formal tutorials, just an intro cutscene or movie, and boom, you start out in our familiar nine-planeted solar system. <laughs> Remember when Pluto was a planet? And you're free to go wherever you want. You soon realize that the Star Control universe is much bigger than our solar system, of course. The game world is on a star map consisting of over 500 distinct solar systems, each with its own set of explorable planets. While the game does railroad you into completing the introductory missions for your home base at Earth, though dedicated players have managed to skip even that, you're soon free to explore any one of those stars and find out who lives there, what resources are there, and your only limitation is how much fuel you have in your tanks. And well, how capable you are of defending yourself from what or whomever you might encounter there. This can seem overwhelming for players who are used to a more guided experience in their games, but there is always enough information to push you in the right direction whether you're looking for resources, friendly aliens, or just something to do. So what do you do when you get to another star system? You check out the planets for resources. From orbit you can send down a planet lander to explore for artifacts, collect the resources, and hunt primitive lifeforms that may be living on the surface. But you can't land on every planet. Gas giants have no landable surface, and you have to watch out for earthquakes, excessively hot planets with streaks of fire flying around, random bolts of lightning, and primitive aliens with deadly instincts. On mildly dangerous planets, this feels like a classic arcade game. Drive around, shoot bad things, dodge dangerous things, and collect all the good things you find. On extremely dangerous planets, well, good luck. Although it can get monotonous, savvy players will seek out planets with the most valuable resources and use their cargo space effectively to build up a nice supply. Unsavvy players will fill up a single cargo bay with worthless junk metals to bring back to a rather displeased commander. Try to avoid getting gruesomely killed, Captain. For me, what keeps it from being boring is that there is so much variety to the planets. There are a few dozen types of planets and moons with their own kinds of minerals, over 20 kinds of primitive lifeforms for you to blast, and the ever-exciting chance of something setting off your energy scanner. Planet exploration will be a hit or miss for some people, but if you enjoy exploration and discovery in your games, then this won't be a sore point for you. And what do you do when you encounter aliens with spaceships? You talk to them! Or you can shoot them if you'd prefer, but anyways, as I mentioned before, the characters and dialogue in this game is what makes Star Control 2 great. In fact, the conversation trees are the part of the game which I look forward to the most each time I replay it. It takes creative thinking to get what you want from most of the aliens, but there are definitely some walls you can back yourself into. Insult someone too much and you might lose an ally. Cross the wrong alien too many times and you'll find weapons pointed at you. You can even surrender to the Urquan which gives you an instant game over. But these kinds of results are usually fairly obvious. Generally, the conversations are as much of a reward as they are a puzzle, with the dialogue being cleverly written and filled with charm. Even the big menacing baddies will occasionally sputter out golden lines, whether it's because they give an overly literal response to something that was clearly an insult, or they reply in a suitably curt manner to your threats. We did. You did. Yes we can. No. And then there's the oars. I am the best word, Frumple. Maybe you do not know. Frumple be round yet lumpy. So bad. Now what do you do if you find guns pointed at you? Well, you're taken to the ship-to-ship -ship combat mode. While your flagship is huge, it's typically underarmed, especially on a first playthrough, so you can choose an escort ship provided by friendly aliens to pilot in combat. This takes us back to the super melee mode that you can select when you boot up the game. Combat takes place on a wrapping two-dimensional plane with a planet in the middle and randomly spawning asteroids that only serve to get in the way of weapons and ships, bouncing around harmlessly but absorbing projectiles and knocking ships out of their trajectories. The planet, of course, has gravity. Ships can be pulled towards it and bounce off of it, often taking major damage, but skilled pilots can use the planet to perform a gravity whip, which lets ships go faster than their acceleration would allow. Just like in real life! I think. Each of the 25 ships in the game plays differently, with different speeds, crew capacities, which is their health, and completely unique weapons. All ships have a primary weapon and a secondary function, which is often a second weapon. For example, the trusty Earthling cruiser is fairly slow and meant to attack from a long range with its heavily damaging nukes, 
and it can fend off attacks and nearby enemies and asteroids with its auto-aiming point defense laser. On the other hand, the Urquan Dreadnought fires gigantic plasma bolts as its primary weapon, and can send out swarms of independent fighter vessels to track down and zap enemies like a pesky swarm of bees. Even in combat, you can see the charm of the game. Alien captains can be seen piloting their vessels along the side of the screen, while the various ships demonstrate the different races' personalities, whether it's the cowardly Spathy who have torpedoes that shoot backwards while they run away from combat, or the Umga who fitted their slow, stubby ships with the ability to zip backwards at incredible speeds because, well, because they like funny things. Given the low price point of the game, which I'll get to later, Super Melee alone almost makes Star Control 2 worth playing today if you're at all into space combat or if you just want to have some head-to-head -head combat games to play alone or with a friend. But the game has so much more to it. The combat is fairly well balanced in the main campaign, with players almost always having access to a ship that can easily counter the enemies that they need to fight against as they progress in the story. And the super melee mode allows players to practice with any ship in the game, including enemy ships. With over a dozen distinct ships potentially available to the player in the main campaign, depending on their actions and alliances, it can be overwhelming to learn how to play this part of the game. And while there is a cyborg option in the main story that will fight your battles for you, it's pretty terrible and will lose battles that even novice players could have won on their own. While it will likely take some practice to learn how to play the ships you have access to, and to learn how to destroy the ships you need to destroy, it's definitely fun to learn. And unless you dive headfirst into enemy territory, you likely won't encounter large fleets of dangerous ships until late in the game, where you might have customized your flagship into an untouchable war machine. The near necessity of practice might turn more casual gamers away, but even novices can get by until the end of the game with some save scumming and using whatever junk ships they happen to have with them. Or just max out your flagship's speed and outrun all your enemies, that works too. Now I love this game and I love the gameplay, but it definitely has some problems that will hurt it in the eyes of modern gamers. There's no quest log or even conversation logs. While you can rewind through the last line that was said, the game was clearly meant to be played with a notepad. This is especially noticeable whenever someone gives you the name of a star or coordinates to a star. While most information is presented in multiple places, occasionally you'll miss some crucial piece of information that you'll wish you wrote down, which isn't something that modern gamers like doing. As well, the early game can feel like a bit of a grind when you need to gather resources to build up a fleet of escort ships and a fast and powerful flagship. Novice players may end up mining little more than garbage and feel like they're accomplishing nothing. And while you do get resources from destroying ships in combat, you need the resources to build up something capable of doing that to begin with. And as I mentioned before, while it's usually easy to avoid, poor diplomacy can lead to missing out on alliances, information and clues, optional but virtually essential items, and even entire side quests. Though thankfully, the game won't allow you to kill any allies who are essential to completing the game, at least not until after they've given you everything you need from them. For this reason, players are often advised to keep multiple saves so they can go back if they really messed something up. But probably the aspect that most harms its playability is the fact that the game has a sort of in-game time limit. Though it could be argued that it's generous, for a new player who takes a slow and steady approach to playing the game, it might not be generous enough. Some players will never encounter this on their first playthrough, while I'm sure others have had their games ended this way. And often players won't be able to reload an earlier save and do things more quickly without going way back. It seems as if the game was designed to be played twice, or maybe restarted once after a trial run to learn the locations of some major items? I can't say for sure, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. The worst part is that it can even catch some players completely off guard. Now there are some patches that can disable or possibly just lengthen this time limit, but having to patch a player unfriendly feature like this would definitely count against the game's modern playability. That being said, I still find the game to be very playable today despite these relics of a time past. Star Control 2 isn't an excessively long game, with how long to beat listing it as between about 9 to 14 hours. Someone playing the game for the first time, learning the ropes, and maybe playing some Super Melee for fun or to practice, can probably get about 20 hours out of the game. Using a guide or replaying the game can make it considerably faster, of course. Generally, Star Control 2 is respectful of your time. You can save almost anywhere at any time except in the middle of conversations or combat. But you can save at the start of an encounter before a conversation or battle, so you can easily reload if you mess something up. 
There are also many save slots in all versions of the game, so you can load an older file if you realize later that you actually didn't want to explode that particular alien. Aside from the early game grind I mentioned earlier, the player is always doing something fun, and there are enough quest threads and hints to drive players towards something new and exciting, provided the player manually keeps a minimal quest log. And typically, players can gather resources while completing quests, so the time you spend playing the game is almost always time you'll enjoy. Thankfully, once quests are started, they're usually easy to follow. Quest items typically have obvious places to bring them to, and many quests are short enough that players can complete them without needing to return home in the middle, provided they brought enough fuel. But if you do run out of fuel, the game has a helpful alien who will offer you enough fuel to get home for a fee. But typically, players won't want to find themselves in that situation, and after learning the basics of fuel management, it's fairly easy not to run into these kinds of emergencies. The only truly disrespectful thing the game does with a player's time is that it has that in-game time limit. While you can play as long as you want when the in-game calendar isn't progressing, if you let too many years pass by without making significant progress in the main plot of the game, you will soon bring your game into an unwinnable condition. However, after the sort of soft time limit, you do have the option of fast-tracking the plot should you wish to go for a somewhat bad ending. As I mentioned earlier though, the time limit can be patched out. Overall, provided you don't run into the time limit, I think that most people would enjoy the time that they spend playing Star Control 2. There are about five versions of the game available. The original PC release on disc, which is probably just a collector's item at this point. There's the 1994 3DO port, which has huge updates like alien voices and even version-exclusive features to this day, including an intro movie and videos showing off each ship. There's also the digital bundle containing the original Star Control and Star Control 2 for PC on sale at GOG.com and on Steam for about $3.99. And then there's the Urquan Masters, a fan-made port of the 3DO version of the game with all of the missing features from the PC version, like subtitles, brought back in. And then there's the Urquan Masters HD remake, which is the Urquan Masters, but with completely redone high-definition artwork for all of the aliens, all of the ships, all of the planets, all of the solar systems, and the planets even orbit their stars as time passes in the game. Wow! Since the 3DO version of the game is around 30 bucks, and who has a 3DO laying around to play it anyways, the console version isn't the best way to play it. Since the original release on PC probably goes for just as much, and the Star Control 1 and 2 bundle costs about $4, clearly the best way to play the game is the fan-made Urquan Masters. It's completely free, works on any computer you're likely to use, and it's the best way to play the game by almost any definition. Again, it's free! It's way better than even pirating the game. The only question is whether to play Urquan Masters or the HD Remaster. If you want to play Star Control 2 because it's an old game and you want to feel like you're in the early 90s playing the game that it originally used to be, download the Urquan Masters. If you want to play Star Control 2 because it sounds like a game that's still fun and unique today but you aren't big on old-fashioned graphics, get the HD Remaster. It's still free. Now I'm going to give the game a subjective rating for each category I mentioned. These are just my opinions, so don't be too mean to me in the comments if you disagree. Anyways, for showing gamers, the game that made Toys for Bob famous in the early 90s before making Skylanders, as well as for having an active fan community for over two decades, I give it a 1.5 out of 2 for its legacy. For having a charming and deep story that is both discovered and crafted by, rather than told to the player, along with an excellent soundtrack and incredible fan remastered graphics that still look good today, I give it a 2 out of 2 for its presentation. For having varied, fun, and challenging yet uncomplicated gameplay, but for almost requiring some early game grinding, I give it a 1.5 out of 2 for its gameplay. For allowing you to save at any time, but for lacking a quest log, and for allowing the player to trap themselves in a potentially unwinnable game if they take too long to progress the plot, I give it a 1 out of 2 for its worth your time factor, or a 1.5 out of 2 with the time limit disabled through patches. And for being available legally in its objective best versions for free, I give it 2 out of 2 points for its worth your money factor. Yes, 8 out of 10 is a good score. I'm not a gaming magazine that gives a 7 scathingly. Star Control 2 is still my favorite game of all time, but I know that it has aspects that will make it a bit unpalatable for some modern gamers. But considering that it's a free game that you can easily get at least 10 hours out of if you want to, I think an 8 out of 10 game is worth playing even if it's not perfect. Check this video's description for links to download the different versions of the game and see for yourself. And if you do end up playing it and you want some spoiler-free hints, just drop a comment and I'd be happy to lend a hand. 
Anyways, let us know what you think about this video. Leave us some positive or negative feedback below and tell us if this is something you'd like to see more or less of. And if you do want to see more, what kind of games would you want to see reviewed like this? Tell us! Anyways, thanks for watching and remember to have an awesome day!